So hello, everybody. Welcome to the last session of a huge house lecture series. And first, we would like to acknowledge the first Australians on whose Australian lands the University of Sydney and this talk stand. The Gadigal of the Euro Nation and pay our respects to the elders past, present, and, and, and pres past and present. Apologies. Uh, today, we have the pleasure to host uh, Kevin Carmody, Carmody Grohl. Um, Kevin is an, an Australian architect uh, based in London, no? Uh, Kevin is the director of Carmo de Gore together with uh, Andy, no? Andy Gore. Kevin studied at the University uh, of Canberra, the undergrad, and the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology, RMIT. He founded London-based studio Carmo de Gore together with Andy Gore in 2006, after they met working together at David Chipperfield. The studio has developed a reputation for working internationally on a wide range of arts, cultural and residential projects. Recently completed works include the temporary house built to protect the Charles McIntosh House in Scotland, the Winder Merjetti Museum in the Lake District, and the restoration of the Special Exhibitions Gallery at the Museum of Science and Industry in Manchester. Current projects include a comprehensive heritage restoration and extension to the Design Museum in Ghent, that probably some of you have seen, that they won in a very important competition, and a site web master plan and new archive for the British Library, Boston Spa. Kevin has lectured internationally, including at Sydney a couple of years ago, where we have the pleasure to host him, and about the work of the practice and taught at several architectural schools, including the Bartlett, the Royal College of Art, the University of Stuttgart, Cornell University, where he was teaching last time we saw him, Yale School of Architecture, and more recently, he was a visiting professor at Harvard University, where he was a visiting design critic. Please join me in welcoming Kevin Carmody. Thank you. Um, I'll begin. Um, thank you very much for your um, uh, time this morning. Um, uh, I uh, we've entitled the the talk this morning "Room City Building." Um, maybe a little bit of explanation on that. Um, uh, for about the last ten years of teaching. Um, we have um, uh, taken room city building as the methodology of our teaching practice. It comes from an observation that architectural education tends to be linear in its conceptions. Um, that being that um, students are set uh, a site plan at maybe one to 5,000. Uh, they reconcile a kind of urban scale at one to 1,000. They move to a kind of neighborhood building scale at one to 500, um, eventually reconciling uh, one to 100 and perhaps even sections at one to one, uh, 50 or 20. And, and in the later years of university, probably required to then design a detail at one to five. Um, we think that this very linear conception of thinking about architecture, um, it precludes the idea that the interior um, and and in and indeed the the user of of, of, of the space and the building the the, the room um, could inform the design at the scale of the city and vice versa. So as we consider um, the brief for a big house, and I believe that's what you've been set um, uh, or um, uh, student housing for many, let's call it. Um, we need to consider the I guess the needs of the individual and the collective. Um, we think that considering the singular in the context and intimacy of the room lets us oscillate as architects in a conversation to the city and its many contexts to the needs of the individual. Architecture can become the reconciliation of these two considerations. And I guess in our studio and in our teaching, we try to look beyond the current client to the city and the future generations. Today, I'll talk about uh, our project in Via Giovanali in, in Milan. It's a new student housing for the Bocconi University in Milan, was, which was developed in partnership with Heinz. Bocconi University was founded in 1902 by a visionary entrepreneur, Fernando Bocconi. And although it does have an undergraduate program, it's probably best known in Europe for its post-graduation, post-grad school, PhD studies in law, economics, and business. Just to let you know, the project was completed in 
2022 and the first students have been in for almost a year. I'll begin by discussing the room. Um, this is a wonderful um, painting that, um, that is located in London of St. Jerome in his studio. Um, uh, these uh, rooms um, were referred to as studiolos. Um, and certainly from the end of the dark ages onwards, they were considered as the kind of learned spaces, um, uh, the, 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 the intimate, um, uh, I guess, important spaces that consider um, not only the, the, the decoration, the, and you can see here a lavishly decorated room, um, but dedicated to reading, studying, and writing. What's interesting about this painting is that it shows the needs of, of um, the individual scaled as a piece of furniture within an overall hall, a cathedral-like space. And the needs of the individual are somehow a smaller element within a, within a cohesive whole um, depicted in the painting. We really like this oscillation, the idea that one small thing could somehow be conceived of as being repeated um, uh, to, make, to make a collective whole. Um, the second thing is that there's, there's the kind of a, a, an intimacy of the scale of the piece of furniture designed around how the user wants to use um, study. So they're elevated off the floor. There's a series of small steps that connect a kind of humanity to the way they interact with, with a table. The desk is tilted to receive a book. And there's a series of shelves that, that take all of the um, personal objects, which ultimately create the individual space. There's a hook for hanging your, your coat or your, or your shawl. And there's a number of other artifacts around which, which really personalize the image. We think that's a really interesting starting point in considering the, the student housing typology. Um, I think the idea of starting with typology is a, is a super interesting and pertinent um, place for students to be looking at the moment. Um, we were recently lecturing in Lausanne and they are currently recategorizing their entire history and theory program around typology. So rather than think of it in movements within history, um, they are actually recategorizing the idea of looking at buildings through typology through history, which I think is probably very relevant to today's um, context and challenges. We did the same in this project and we, we set out with this client um, um, to look at all the typologies across Europe. We began by looking at all the relevant um, modes of, of accommodation that could fall into that. They included um, hotels, um, student housing, um, co-living models, um, and, and a range of, of types of housing in between. What was really interesting from this study, and you can see one of the precedents here in Amsterdam that we looked at, is that we categorized all of the um, components of those, those buildings and very clear set of principles started to emerge. Um, first of all, that many models of housing um, uh, varied in their, their um, scale and proportion of, of use in the building. And by that, I mean, there was always a kind of back of house area. There's an amount of um, space attributed to student housing. And then there are um, a, a series of uh, amenity facilities. Now, some of those amenities are fulfilled in student housing elsewhere on the campus. Um, however, in, in this instance, um, most of them are within the building. The other thing is that the room size varied between 14 to 25 meters squared. Um, the, smaller room, the smaller the room size, we observed that the larger proportion of amenities that were needed, including shared kitchens, um, as well as other facilities. We also talked to a lot of the facilities managers when we went to these precedents. And interestingly, the biggest complaints in management terms around student housing were to do with noise and the management of the shared facilities. Many of these buildings lacked 
external amenity spaces. The interesting thing that we're seeing in London and indeed in Europe is that there's an emerging market for adopting these shared living models into mainstream housing. Um, and indeed the London plan has just been released um, on large scale purpose-built shared living accommodation. I think we would have to say in this talk that, that we would present some concerns about this approach. Um, we think that student housing is for a relatively short period of one's life and only generally during term time. And we would say, and it's difficult, it's normally a specific stage of one's life when people are fairly young. To use these models as long-term permanent models for people's lives uh, as accommodation, I think is quite concerning. So, hybridization, I think increasingly what we're seeing are models that um, combine older modes of um, accommodation, such as colleges, where we combine an idea of both living and studying within the building itself, and the modern um, amenities and services provided within a hotel. Increasingly, we see the student as a type of consumer in this market, and their demands are much broader than they were historically. So our brief for this project included not only operations and back of house, entrance areas, security, community areas, supporting education rooms, co-working and study rooms, kitchens, as well as the bedrooms, shops, cafe, restaurants, laundries, film rooms, screening rooms, external recreation spaces and gymnasiums. So in that sense, we're somewhere between these two models and we're combining a lot of the amenities of both. What seems interesting to us is that there, we zoom from all of those supporting functions down to the individual room and what needs to be in it and how we support it. The bedroom is such a small element and rather banal in the context of repeating it some six our student housing is for 600 students and I think you need to be quite comfortable with the relative banality of this room. The scale of these buildings are much bigger than the city grain and perhaps its historic context. In fact they probably tend towards the sublime. As such as architects we need to look for points of architectural difference and similarity when considering this challenge. We began by looking at what are the requirements of um, arrival. When one comes here, what do they need to feel? What, they, what do they need to do? And these are some of the earliest illustrations we talked about where, although we had not much idea of the scale of um, um, the buildings or how the urban approach was, we knew that there was a sense of arriving and that everyone would arrive through one door. And in fact, that, that for well-being, but also for security, there's an important requirement to check in on students and that they're able to converse and manage, um, uh, converse with the managers and ensure that they're, um, they're part of that community as they arrive. There's also a connection from the externally in the gardens at the back. As we look at that space, we have a convivial foyer where people will connect each day, wait for their friends, perhaps even external um, friends in the community would wait for tenants, um, for, for um, people living in this building to come down. So we see this very much as a public foyer, as something that engages with the street and brings the street into it. In addition to that, that it needs to connect to the other social spaces, which will be quieter, more study spaces, particularly at the end of term, as you know, where every room in a student housing becomes um, uh, a potential study space for revision. As we come up into the building, it's very important that there's, there's um, a series of acoustic uh, thresholds through the building. First of all, into the lift lobby, and then out of the lifts, this image portraying the upper floor as we come into um, the building. 
and that that space directly connects from the lift into the social space of each community. So out of the lift, you're not coming into the corridor, you're coming into human social spaces. You're coming not uh, noisy and late at night, um, waking up students who might have gone to bed earlier, but you're also encouraged to come in and interact with the other people within your group. And that that space then connects out to external terraces. And then from that kitchen or communal space, we're connecting to a bedroom. In our project, we, we from that very broad research across Europe, we narrowed to three typologies of bedrooms. They're unusual probably to the Australian market, but they are very focused on the, the um, nuances of Milan and, and particularly the Bocconi uh, University as a postgraduate school um, predominantly. So they, there's a lot of people doing further business studies or PhDs or MBAs. The first of those typologies um, to introduce, uh, we've referred to as an ensuite. Um, this, this was a kind of generalized term, meaning that each of these rooms has an ensuite within it. Um, a small bedroom, a study area, storage space, but a shared kitchen uh, and living room. Um, these rooms um, uh, connect well. They think carefully about a student staying here for several months at a time, including storage under the bed for suitcases. They are very carefully designed, almost like a piece of furniture, so that the bed, the desk, um, the shelves are all conceived of as joinery within the overall space. Um, the second typology of bedroom that we looked at, we referred to as a studio. Um, many as of the students are um, slightly older, and some of them um, do have uh, partners coming to stay, and this would be probably one of the, the models for that. And uh, this is a um, bedroom with a double bed and indeed a um, small kitchenette within the space. Um, you can see here in section, it works very similarly, slightly broader dimensions and the images of that space. Um, once again, designed completely in joinery um, around the room. Um, the last of those is a twin share, which shares two beds in one space, um, and that's showing um, also an image of a studio. Um, these bedrooms were then considered, and if we think about the idea of the clusters, um, ensuite bedrooms that we described, we, from the research we did, one of the major challenges of student housing is kind of making a group of students work together, um, live together um, within a space that where they actually take care of the facilities themselves. And really interestingly, there's a tipping point in this socially. Um, and interestingly, from what we can see and the research, it works um, at around a family unit. So um, at around uh, five or six people. Um, very interestingly, people don't steal milk from the fridge, people take bins down, um, and they take care of the environment um, themselves. So what we see on this slide is a cluster of 10 rooms. Um, those 10 rooms um, uh, share two kitchens. So they have five people sharing a kitchen each. So they're assigned a kitchen and, and a shared living area. Interestingly, that socially works very well because we can get 10 people sitting around the main table um, and dining together. So those kitchen facilities then open out onto a terrace where uh, we can all eat outside as well. But importantly, there's other spaces where people who don't feel like eating collectively can grab the food at a counter or indeed study whilst others are eating in this space. Um, so it becomes a very important social space. It's a very careful balance between the scale of the room itself and the scale, the bedroom itself and the scale of these shared spaces. Um, I think we then zoom back to the city and introduce where we are in the world. So we've done all that research just thinking about the room and what the building needs to do before we even think about designing the building. And we think about that 
really from the inside out, considering the inhabitant and how it needs to, um, each of those individual pieces then connects to the outside world. So for those who haven't been to Italy, um, and very conscious this lecture is in Australia and it's a long way to come. Uh, we're right at the north of Italy um, and uh, fairly central in Europe, very, very well connected. Um, uh, one can drive up into Switzerland or into France or even Germany in, in, in very little time at all. Um, what is um, uh, really important about this city is that it used to be sort of the capital of the north of Italy. And if we look at the historic map here, we have a medieval grain um, overlaid with a series of city walls. City walls were indeed um, formalized at one point and then deformalized into the circulation of the city, the roads and, and major infrastructures. It also has a kind of Napoleonic overlay of, of master plan where you see a kind of French introduction of formal gardens and, and, and castle um, uh, palace uh, to, the, to the north. Um, Rome is to the south and the important roads into to Rome probably connected south and indeed our site is towards that size. So if we connect to a modern um, map of the city, one can see that overlay of the two inner ring roads, which used to be the kind of formal um, uh, defenses of the city, which have now become the kind of primary infrastructure and ring roads. And you can see that that um, uh, French overlay of kind of formal gardens and set piece to the north still remains. The red dot is our location. And in fact, we're just outside the, the medieval um, uh, uh, defences of the city, the second ring road. If we zoom into a map to place that, um, uh, once again, uh, the city centre is here and the Duomo, um, we see the, the kind of gardens and, and, um, and a major um, castle um, formation. Um, this is the Bocconi University, um, uh, uh, of which we're just to the side of. And this is our site. And indeed, there's a cultural regeneration happening in this area. The dots show those kind of ring roads um, as, as they trace through. And they're very much uh, important um, uh, landmarks in the navigation of, of Milan, those, these, these kind of ring roads. Um, just, just for those um, in context, we have the Duomo here. We have um, really important um, infrastructures such as the canal um, that follow the, the kind of ring roads around. Um, we have a number of developments around um, the Bocconi University. Grafton did a very important building for them a number of years ago, which is one of their business school buildings. And SANA have recently completed a series of um, uh, student housing uh, just near our site. What's really important um, about the context of Bocconi University is that um, historically it has had very little student housing. The model for Italians studying is generally that they live at home and they live at home uh, with their parents. And uh, uh, so there hasn't been a huge demand. And I think when we started this project, Bocconi University only had provision for some 20% of the students um, to actually stay in student housing. I think what we see is a changing of attitude on that, um, perhaps culturally um, uh, families and, and indeed the children are wanting to stay on campus and at university more. Um, but there's um, secondly, a, a, a huge intake of international students coming into this university. So there's a, there's a number of changes there that are increasing the demand. And this map shows a number of student housing um, that either already exists or indeed was in development at the time uh, of our project beginning. Maybe a little bit about um, Milan, and I think um, it's, it's hard to generalize, but for those who haven't traveled to Milan, I think I'd like to try and give a little bit of a context for you. Um, I think we, we try and characterize um, a number of key important um, architectural qualities of Milan. Um, and I've, I think generalizing is sometimes 
dangerous, but for this audience, we feel it's important to give this context. Um, if we were describing in Italy um, uh, the cities, perhaps we would say Rome is considered solid or massive or carved from stone. Milan is comparatively thin, built of layers, not carved of solid stone. This is both a geological observation in terms of the availability of material. It's also an attitude that of course changed over time culturally about the capital of the North and Italy and the context of the antiquity of Rome. It's also fundamentally climatologically, climatological I should say. Um, so in our observations of, the, of this building, a good Milanese building, a house, is made up of three key elements. So we'll talk a little bit about those characters. First of all, the foyer. Um, the Milanese foyer is, is typologically very important. The exterior of the buildings, I would say, are generally austere. Um, they, they are fairly plain and they don't, they wouldn't consider it um, uh, extremely expressive in architectural quality or material. However, the foyers are rich. Um, I'd say they're rich in materials, rich in their detailing, and rich in their color often. The second is to look at the idea of facades. And here we see a historic image um, showing the kind of 18th, 19th century context of, of central Milan. This is a grain made up of smaller buildings, five to six stories in height. These are generous buildings that reinforce the grain of the street and the back edge of the pavement with a continuity of townscape. These are walk-up buildings. They have a quality of being made of pieces, a thinness in their expression and generally a lack of ornament and in, in their exterior. Here's a bomb map of Milan and the challenge that the city faced post-World War II. And I think what we were really interested in here is that at a point in history where, where the city was looking to ideas about how it could reconstruct itself quickly and what would be its new urban strategy, there were a number of very, very interesting architects that took, I guess, a lead, um, not theoretically, but in the way they conceived of making rather quietly, um, rather, um, I would say, academically, um, uh, and found a new kind of typology for the mill. So a little bit about Asnago Venda. Um, they're a very interesting architect working in the post-war period in Milan. And their buildings are characterized by a very important things. First of all, generally they were taller than the historic grain of five or six stories. They were normally eight or nine stories. In doing that, they couldn't follow the historic neoclassical and they needed to look to new modes of proportioning and openings. These were somehow banal or background buildings in the city, looked, looking to repair the fabric of the city somehow in, in, I guess, the demand of that post-war reconstruction. But in a switch of scale, these buildings didn't fall into, I guess, mocking or copying historic precedents. They used subtle proportioning adjustments to create a richness of effect and a richness of opening. They looked to the qualities of the historic city as a kind of thinness and this idea that buildings are made up of pieces, not carved out of solid material. And they relied on a, a kind of asymmetry, um, an idea that a subtle changing, a shift, in a window or a proportion could give scale and humanity to a much bigger scale urban fabric. These buildings were really important to Milan, but they were also fundamental to our understanding 
of the challenge of designing a large um, student housing block in this city. The last element was to think of um, a way of characterizing the Milanese building um, typology with roof terraces. And there are historically, probably because of the very hot and humid climate that, that Milan has through the summer um, of these incredible roof terraces, which um, profligate all of the 18th, 19th century buildings, as well as many of the, the modern interventions. And we felt that external terraces um, really offered a way of mediating this environment when it does become quite, um, quite hot and humid, um, much more so than, than Sydney even. Um, so to focus on the site, here's our site um, shown within the context of Milan. And you can see that large route uh, north-south leading from Rome into the city and the second ring road that I've been talking about. You can see the graft and tight grain urban building sitting here and the sauna plan form of their new student housing. As we zoom to look at our site, um, it was characterized by um, a real shift in grain. And what I mean by this is that we're right at the edge of the 19th century city grain where the buildings start to break down into a kind of more modern idea of setting a building back from the city edge, from the urban street edge, and creating slightly more tower, standalone object buildings within the city. It's also on the edge of what we would call the kind of industrial um, uh, edge of Milan. And here we see an overview of our site before we started. Um, our site is this one here, where there's a large um, um, warehouse building on half of our site. And you can see here the kind of back hinterlands, the more modern interventions, breaking down the street form, industrial buildings, and right on the edge of the kind of continuous grain form of the city. Um, so we're right on that, that kind of um, bridging point of those two contexts. And indeed, many of the contexts around there, whether it, we look to the canals just north of us, the tr railway tram sheds that are just adjacent to our site, or, or indeed the context of the larger ring roads that connect through the infrastructures. Um, we began a project looking to see if we could retain and reuse this, this existing warehouse as student housing. I think um, we need to remember this building was designed five or six years ago. We pushed very, very hard on the idea of keeping and retaining this building. And um, there were two obstacles against us. Um, uh, the first of all, um, uh, and that was the plan form of that um, shown in the model. The first of all is, is a urban planning principle in Milan. Um, we um, uh, refer to it in the studio as a kind of 60 degree rule and it, many of the cities in Europe kind of adopt a principle of kind of sunlight and daylight um, uh, adopted from the windows of those buildings opposite. These, these rules from an urban strategy um, uh, predominate come from a kind of five or six story idea of the city and unfortunately as a building, uh, sorry, as, as cities get more dense and, and increase in height above that level, they don't really um, allow or, or, or um, adapt to encourage um, buildings that reinforce this urban edge. And such, we see that th this massing diagram actually pushes an idea of doing a tower in the middle of the, of the site rather than reinforcing the street edge, if that makes sense. And you can see the buildings adjacent us on this side and this side have both done that in order to increase the height above the, the general um, grain of the city. The second, second issue um, we came across on this site, which was one um, which was ultimately um, ruled out us reusing this building is that the previous use of the warehouse was, was um, storage, but prior to that, that was manufacturing. And, and during the post-war era, there was um, extreme contamination of this site. 
So at any point we penetrated the concrete slab, we were required to remove all of the soil from the site and decontaminate it. At the point you're decontaminating the soil, um, really it was almost impossible to keep the building um, uh, in, in place because obviously we would need to reinforce the foundations to, to build on top of it. So in that sense, it was really limiting. Um, what it did, however, do is allow us to create um, a very interesting um, sectional idea on the, on the site and um, uh, uh, obviously environmentally improve um, the area radically by um, decontaminating this, this historic site. So with that, those two challenges in urban terms, we evolved a plan form from the idea of creative reuse of the existing building slowly through a series of studies into um, uh, this form. Um, right from the very earliest um, studies of the site, we felt that the road from Rome was quite important. And this aspect of considering the building viewed from the south um, gave us an opportunity to kind of break um, the scale of the surrounding area slightly, acknowledge that route, both visually and give a more elegant gable um, form to the building from this direction. And this is one of the earliest studies of that end of the building. We broke the building mass down into three sections. Um, we, um, you can see here, the form of the building basically reinforces the street edge, uh, stepping up from a smaller building to a mid form and then an L shape, enclosing a courtyard on this side. Um, you can see here the building mass shown from the courtyard back and the gable end um, showing the higher scale building stepping down in form and then relating to the lower scale buildings around it. The building at the lower levels was a series of public spaces. They were connecting not only the communities, the living in the building, but also active frontages of shops, cafes, restaurants, connecting the neighborhood into the building. On the right hand side, you see a diagram the block in, that connects, uh, illustrates, pardon me, block A, block B, block C. These are typologically referring to those three types of housing that we, uh, rooms that we showed earlier. So block A is en suites, block B is studios, and block C yeah, no, is shared Oops. accommodation. Um, the, Right from the very earliest conception, we were very interested in this idea of within that overall massing strategy, taking those repetitive, mundane somehow elements, but just playing with the proportion and shape of those openings to ensure that the building gained character from repeating those elements. So once again, the singular element of the bedroom is is repeated, but its proportioning in the overall elevation is adjusted slightly and adapted either to the balcony, the living space, or the bedroom. And that those characteristics are amplified in the elevation and indeed in the building. And here you can see that balconies and the living spaces to the gable ends or ends of the spaces, giving character in scale and proportion. You can also see a midpoint where those proportions sort of change from a shoulder of the building to the upper part. So as we see the elevation, we see a careful study of shifting very subtle proportions of those openings um, from a base, a middle and a top, repeating the elements of those bedrooms and subtly adjusting um, those proportions vertically and horizontally to give character. We also looked at how the materiality of the building could subtly change through its form to give character, to break the scale down, not only to the grain of the three buildings, but also to its height and its overall proportioning. And here we see a large one to, um, I think one to 100 scale model, um, quite large in the studio where we were testing some of those ideas where windows and openings 
balconies, reveals, and depth. They're all being adjusted slightly in their composition to give an overall building form. And these were the early studies of those in render form, um, where we see that gable end is viewed from the south and the cluster of three buildings um, and some that began to develop from the early arrival where we see that single point of entry for three buildings connecting immediately to the external spaces and a social space connecting not only the street but some of those working spaces and indeed community spaces and on the right we see post boxes and below to some of the working and um, uh, social co-working spaces for, for the building. And to the rear where we see a courtyard and now taking advantage of that sunken excavation to create an enclosed courtyard space, benefiting the westerly aspect and, and indeed um, um, more recreational spaces for, um, for the residents. So here we see a cluster of um, three buildings indicated in a range of colors. Um, those colors highlight where kitchens, dining rooms, um, bedrooms, and indeed uh, social spaces occur. This is a typical upper floor from floors one to six. And you can see that building A on the left is shared kitchen um, spaces and, and, and living spaces with en suites. We have studios where they're shared kitchen, sorry, shared social spaces are on the ground floor. And the last is the twin chair where we see those shared kitchen spaces in the middle. Um, uh, and as we move down, this is a typical um, ground floor where we move in um, uh, to a lobby space connecting a series of um, uh, uh, spaces through the building down to the lower ground floor below that, uh, which makes benefit of that sunken courtyard, gym spaces and multi-purpose rooms below. In the consideration of the material of the building, um, we, we looked at some of the most important um, stone buildings in, um, in Milan. And really interestingly, um, as Nago Venda also often use this material in the base of the buildings as a kind of rustication. This is a Cepo stone and um, uh, C-E-P-P-O, which has a kind of very, very figured um, volcanic quality. It almost looks like a terrazzo in its raw state. And it's been used on various buildings. And you can see, in fact, Grafton used it for their building in a very thin, um, um, quality. The, the um, Chepo stone is almost exhausted in its um, uh, uh, original um, uh, mining um, excavation. And, and so what we've done is try to see how we could use this material in an interesting way. And here you see some of those volta volcanic qualities on, on the building. Um, this is indeed its raw stone quality. And you can see it it binds together almost stones of various quality within the volcanic quality of, of, of the, of the, the material itself. Um, so what we look to do is see what Chepo stone was still available and indeed it's very available still in small pieces and aggregate. And so we considered how we could make the facade in pieces. So this is um, the production of, um, uh, from the mine um, of the Chepo stone being broken up into aggregate, being made in blocks and indeed then being sliced through with a binder. So these are the three qualities. And really interesting, this is exactly the same material with three separate finishes. So just by um, uh, one is one is sort of struck, um, uh, uh, sand cut, um, uh, sorry, um, struck and then um, saw cut. And then the next is um, uh, uh, almost um, sandblasted. And then the last one has a has a etching into it. And those processes just bring out different textures and different qualities of the stone material, but give an incredibly varied um, uh, material color. And here you can see um, a detail of the final building employing those three colors 
into the quality of the facade. Um, a number of aspects probably to draw your attention to. First of all, the base of the building is considered um, as a solid masonry element and indeed the um, pieces of stone are load bearing and indeed grouted in up until a certain datum. And secondly, that those, um, those pieces are thought of, although thin in their expression and with a bird's mouth detail in the, the corner and reveal, um, considered their expressing expression as a kind of more solid base, a more load bearing, but also um, somehow um, uh, rusticated through its texture. Um, however, above that, we've got a we've got a deliberate expression of of open jointing, and and this is really expressing the very thinness of the material, and the reveals are not as deep of those windows, and um, importantly, those. Um, those uh, uh, corners, those those points where you turn the material into a reveal or a corner are expressed with an open bird's mouth joint. So to explain the project now, um, having explained its conception from room through city and the understanding of its context through to the building, I'll conclude by showing a number of images of the completed project. Um, here we can see, looking from the city back to the building, a cluster of three buildings. And you can see it's quite large scale. It steps down in the furthermost block C on the right to the scale of the post-war building on the right. It moder modulates the scale of three buildings by stepping in its form through its middle. and it once again plays with the careful balance of openings between living spaces and bedroom spaces within those three blocks. The open terraces are really important to the building. And we see here, not only a ground floor, a very open and convivial building, open to the neighborhood and active front. The building is set back from its ownership line to create a new public space in front of it. And indeed, those balconies now open and make active, and I would say um, uh, uh, energetic elements that, that now start to work with how the building is used. At a certain floor, that switches and the balconies move to the west side where we can benefit the afternoon sun on that side of the building. And you can see the living sp spaces articulated on the, on the eastern side. Moving inside the building, um, you can see we've brought through a kind of idea of a kind of rich, um, uh, uh, but also very um, hard wearing floor. And the building moves through from that central point where all three buildings come in through one address. Once again, very important to the kind of well being and keeping an eye on students, um, but also very important to the community and the idea that there's chance encounter you can see your friends and you can enjoy this as a social space. Um, those social spaces are incredibly well used, um, particularly at times at the end of term where everyone is studying together and working very hard um, towards their exams. Um, and these spaces connect both out to um, the external spaces in, in nicer weather and indeed, um, in, in event mode, these, this is where they have drinks on a Friday night, film events, uh, amongst other things. All of the furniture is designed specifically for the building. As we see the warmer weather starting to happen, you start to see the benefits of the courtyard to the rear in this sunken southwest facing courtyard. And um, although we see a little bit of sunbathing going on here, most of the e events in the very warm humid summer are outside and this is a very very well used space into the evening um, the basketball court and linked from um, uh, some of the um, cafe and restaurant spaces through um, and we see some of the upper spaces this is one of the social sort of kitchen spaces in use connecting through to a terrace um, indeed one of the um, uh, pocket terraces that looks back at the city um, and 
um, and one of those terrace spaces with the incredible views out to the Alps in the distance. Um, I think there's a careful balance in these bedroom spaces in, in terms of making sure that they feel um, uh, uh, useful, practical, um, and that each person is able to adapt them to their own use. And I think that's a careful balance about designing the furniture to fit the space well and allowing enough adaptability for each student in there. Um, most of the furniture is, is, is designed specifically for this room. And um, they benefit the views out, as well as um, uh, the careful um, uh, privacy intimacy needed um, for, for each um, living space, for each dwelling. And as we zoom back to the city, um, and we, we, we see the context of the surrounding brain and we see the building seen really in fragments, um, those glimpses between the buildings and around it um, uh, towards um, uh, our building. Um, I think we would note here that this project is significantly interested in being um, the idea that um, I guess student housing can be part of a city as well as part of the campus. Um, I think we're trying to normalize the idea of the big house or student housing with good urbanism. And architecture can be a relative background in a city, um, not only a foreground to those living there. Um, I think we've tried to illustrate that our interest as architects is to work between the singular or the student and the room, giving a sense of ownership and enjoyment and community and the wider collective to be a relative background to the city and its many contexts. Architecture becomes somehow a reconciliation of these considerations projected forward to a future generations with people in the city. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin, for the thorough explanation of such a Milanese background building. Um, I think the idea was we were going to have um, a respondent, but Andrew Leach is sick, one of our historians that knows Italy very well, and I thought it would be a fantastic opportunity, but unfortunately he couldn't join us. So we are going to open one question, if you don't mind, for the public or the audience, and then uh, we'll let you. Anybody, any question? So the lecture theater is there. So some of them are living through the back. But <laughs> any questions or any of the tutors or guys or anybody in the audience? Any Asnago vendor fans like are ready to appropriate this building or or not? Yeah, yeah. come here. <laughs> there is one student, okay? Hello, good morning. Good evening. Um, you said that the building was finished about a year ago. Um, have you been back and speaking, spoken to the students and to the, I guess, maintenance team and, and sort of, I guess the question is, how's the building been received? Um, uh, personally, no, not yet. And I think we will be going back to see the client and talk to them um, a little bit more um, probably in um, after the summer, which is the completion of the first year, if that makes sense. Um, our, our scholastic year finishes in, in um, July. So um, we, we're just at that point now. Um, we, we obviously talked to the client um, who, who in doing this project has set up their own student housing um, uh, operator called Aparto. And we, we are in close communication with them because they manage and run um, some 12 or 15 across Europe. And um, certainly from, by all accounts, it's, um, the reports are, it's certainly set a new bar in terms of student housing um, as being sort of more grown up. It's got many, many more facilities um, in the amenities section than most student housing. And I guess playing to who the primary 
um, students are of Bocconi, it's working well because many of those are postgrads and perhaps they expect a kind of higher level of quality of finish and, um, and indeed service. So for that reason, I think it's working very well. Um, in terms of occupation, I can tell you it's 100% occupied. There is, it was very, um, there, there was always going to be a demand there, um, but I think we're just at the point of kind of getting um, that first year full feedback um, from, from the building. Um, I think there is um, um, perhaps something to say in, in, in the quality of the finish, I would say, it's very unusual in Europe to have a building which which is um, certainly stone in its representation, and that that's very hard to achieve in the in the cost models of student housing. Um, uh, they're normally a very affordable um, construction methodology, so we've fought very hard to get that facade um, uh, to, to retain a quality and a longevity to the building, but also to give something back to kind of the neighborhood that this building had a kind of presence that was coherent with the city. Um, I think the second thing is that we fought very hard to design the, all of the interiors as well as the exteriors of the building. And I think that's critical in the quality and coordination of the inside. Um, I think it feels very coherent and we're, you know, designing everything down to the furniture has allowed us to ensure that there's, there's a quality in all of the elements one touches in the building. And I think those are probably the things in terms of the uses that people really remember. Um, and, and I think that um, the, the initial feedback when we completed the project by people visiting and certainly at the opening when there was everybody came to have a look was was that there was a real sense of quality in in the way it's made and um i think i would give absolute credit to the craftspeople in this particular region um Milan is known for its design but particularly its furniture quality and i would say all of the the manufacturers um, and contractors we worked with on the project um building this during COVID, I would add, um, uh, were absolutely exemplary. And, um, you know, um, they, they really know their craft and we learned a lot working with them. We miss that craft, as you know, here. And um, Kevin, I think one of uh, some of the images you saw were already being occupied, no? There's some of them we haven't seen, but some of the rooms were in, in use and it, it was nice to see how it's being appropriated. Um, but yeah, I think many of us were always wondering how you manage to deliver uh, student housing with that level of finishes. Like it's, um, it's very unthinkable for, for the Australian housing. Uh, it's obviously um, a specific client though, that is trying to do things well. It's also linked to the Australian, but it's also linked to the ordinariness of the scheme. No? And the, so it's, it's knowing the student housing is also about knowing where to play the battles. And I think they are it's on the, the reveal on the stone on the ground floor is bigger than the other one. The, the, you, I think you said at some point how you need to be okay of how ordinary were some of their room layouts. And perhaps it's okay because the battle on that one is to make a building in the city. And it's probably much stronger from a city perspective than from, from that room perspective, despite you have explained it by and back. No? And I think this is something we are trying to explain to students that the student housing forced you to be very specific on where, where to play the battle no? and where if it's in the foyer, no? And then to, to do the foyer, Kevin has been checking every single Milanese foyer. He knows how rich they are. And then it's enough that color or not, that double heights, I think it's a nice gesture towards that Milanese apartment. But the battles is, is very important. You know, you need to know which ones to, to put forward in the contemporary scene of how to make buildings as that one. I, I think that's a really important point. I, I think there is a, there is a rigor in in um, in the project based in the economic realities of building at this scale, and and one can one can only um, uh, make special or make uh, unusual certain elements. And I think we enjoyed that rigor, um, and and somehow. Um, in amplifying the ordinary um, elements and working within, in fact, what's readily available, either materially, um, we, we talked about 
the facade using um, uh, the, the only Chepo stone now now available. We can't get it in large pieces to reconstruct it, or, or indeed using very standard window sizes, but playing with their proportions uh, or standard window systems. I say I'd say, but playing with their proportions and opening um, felt like the right emphasis in this location in order to invest more quality into, as you say, the interiors or the particular public and and um, social spaces of the building, um, which improve much more the quality of life those of those living there, or indeed making argument to the client that we should have one kitchen for every five students, for instance, as as an argument to say that will reduce the maintenance and and problems that you have in your management of the space because within a, such a small group there's we they can almost manage themselves there, there's a, there's enough dialogue between that group almost like a family unit to take care of of the building for it for themselves and i think that's very much what we're seeing um, and hearing from the clients so far um, and and i think those those decisions are a very careful series of judgments aren't they about where you place emphasis in in the design and emphasis in in um in your uh, uh your your cost plan Kevin, one more thing and i think that follows up nicely is in australia like the service providers here is all the student housings are full of awful carpet full ceilings everywhere like and i think alicia posnick is mentioning how do you manage the relationship with the client to convince them of this slightly more bare aesthetic where the piece of furniture fits within the room but the spouse ceilings the things and i think this is something very australian question obviously we are very worried with some of the, these things and some of the relationship with the client and i think perhaps be nice kevin that you it's on the chat, uh, probably better articulated. We know this is a special client, thank but it still is a, you need to convince. Thank, thank you. It's a, it, it, yeah, it's, look, um, I think, think those are technical um, questions. And I think you've got to use economics, um, almost like judo to help um, create those opportunities. So we looked at a number of construction methods for this building hybrid clt we looked at um clt we looked at um uh, uh, uh steel uh deck with concrete infill we looked at a number of construction methodologies interestingly um in in many housing forms we're seeing actually the limiting factor is both fire and acoustic and once you come to terms with CLT the requirements of Yes, with CLT particular, and 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 and, and, um, and even if you can get around the fire requirements of CLT, the acoustic separation isn't met often by that material. So, we we've ended up with with what might be considered a slightly higher carbon, but we've made an argument that that with with a concrete frame, we can avoid putting all of those other layers of finishes in. Um, now, I think if we take a slightly longer view on the building, we also um, proposed slightly higher floor to ceiling levels, and we managed to expose those finishes as the as the final finish. So, in lots of ways, that um, that meant that we could reduce cost in the internal fit out to invest in the quality of the of the the um, raw structure to and leave that exposed. That took a lot more coordination in services and, and investment in design. It didn't necessarily cost more when we got to site. It, it, it did take a lot of investment into, at a design stage to convince everybody that that wouldn't cost more. Um, so I think as much as you can to use those other tactics of the requirements under regulation that the building needs and how you best create um, environmental details. So for instance, I didn't talk much about environment today, but um, this building performs very, very well most of the year round as a naturally ventilated building. Milan has, however, an incredibly oppressive summer temperature, hugely humid, um, uh, with very low wind air movements. And uh, when most people go up to the Alps and the mountains on holidays, 
Um, so those, um, those uh, the thermal mass of those slabs do a big job at regulating the temperature in those spaces. We do, in fact, have an m &E system, which we, we switch on when the temperatures get too high or too cold, because it also alarms. So um, its temperatures are similar to Sydney, but more extreme. Um, so in that sense, um, what we try to do is kind of make something that is as passively can. Um, you know, it has external blinds, it has all of those things that a Milanese building does to regulate temperature, but it has, I guess, it benefits of some of those things like thermal mass. And making an argument for the concrete frame in carbon terms, we can reduce the energy in use radically by having that additional thermal mass so i think once again i don't think these things are as black and white as perhaps we, okay. we always assume and when you when you work very hard through those principles combining fire acoustic thermal mass running costs perhaps you can then make an argument for exposing finishes in a way that um, uh, gets you a very different look in fact an increased floor to ceiling height a sense of volume that perhaps you're not getting in this market and indeed, um, a, a really um, well designed interior around that. I hope that answered that question. Yeah, Thank you. very logical explanation. I think the thermal is a slightly different to Sydney, the, 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 the advantages that an active slab gives you. But still, I think, uh, I think it's great to, to listen to some of the logics behind all these things. And I think hopefully, students learn how to argue some of these things. And Alicia says, Thank you as well. So I think with that, Kevin, we are going to let you continue the day. Thanks very much for sharing your rigor with our students. They are very tired of us telling you need more rigor to address this typology. And I hope after Adrian, after Roger, you have all seen how rigor is so important in the way we approach contemporary architecture. Thank you, Kevin. Have a good day. Thanks very much for joining Thank us. You all. Thanks everybody really for it. joining. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Take care. Ciao. Thanks, everybody. See you next year.